Chapter 21 At first, Flora couldn't see how they could possibly succeed without bait to bring the rats to them. But Alaric led Sophia and Flora behind a wooden post and put his fingers to his lips. Then he slipped away. From the other end of the hold, a terrific banging began along the wall and floor. Knocking and thumping came closer and closer. Soon they could hear the sound of the thousand tiny feet running toward them. Flora tensed her muscles. Turn around and wait for it, Sophia whispered. I'll tell you as soon as the racks are in place. Flora turned. Now, said Sophia. Flora fired her feet back behind her. The rats were thrown into a panic. They ran this way and that. Flora kicked and kicked while Sophia dashed in for the cleanup. As the remaining rats disappeared in the dimness, the lantern bobbed toward them. Alric fell to his knees, counting in a low voice. Nice work, four more. He laid his stick down and scratched both of his teammates on the head. What would I do without you guys? He tossed the dead rats in a pile, and then he was up again. Flora and Sophia took their places for another round. By the time Amos came downstairs with breakfast, Flora was back on her chain. Sophia and Alric stood behind twelve rats in two piles, waiting for the cook. Flora looked on with pride. The rats had been hunted down with skill and teamwork. Big Amos peered at the boy and cat as if trying to understand what had happened. You two wait for me. After putting Flora's slops out, he went back upstairs and returned with his hands full. Good kitty. He put a plate down for Sophia and patted the cat on the head. Food for the rat boy, too. Fresh biscuits, scrambled eggs, above deck. Come with me and throw these overboard. Alaric grabbed a bunch of tails in each hand and followed. He was gone all day, but when he came back with the cook the next morning, he stuck around after Big Amos left. He united Flora and all three to their places. Flora heard the stick begin knocking at the far end of the ship. She and Sophia smiled at each other and waited for their return with the rats. By this time, just as the first wave reached them, heavy footsteps, footsteps sounded at the top of the stairs. This panicked the rats even more than usual. Instead of simply running from the sound of Alaric's stick, they began leaping about like fish, scurrying in many directions. Flora felt a split second of fear. What would Amos do if he found her unchained again? But she couldn't waste the work of Alaric had done hurting the rats. It was too late to hide anyway. Her body went into a crouch, and when Sophia gave the signal, she began spinning and kicking. When the last of the rats had been killed or had escaped, Flora turned to face Amos. But it was not the cook. Standing on the bottom step was another man. He took his hat off and smiled. I wondered what all the banging was down here. Cook told me some good but mis mistress work was being done on our rat problem. I thought I should take a look. He stepped onto the floor of the hold and walked toward them. Amos said it was a cat and boy operation. But it looks to me as if we have a secret weapon. He scratched behind one of Flora's ears and ran his hand down Flora's back to the tip of her tail. If I hadn't seen it for myself, I wouldn't have believed it. Ha, hello, Captain, Alaric stammered. Flora caught her, caught her breath. What's your name, son? Alaric, the cabin boy, sir. He brought his feet together and made a clumsy salute. Alric, there is no sailor on this boat working harder than you. The captain kicked his heels and saluted in return. It seems you have found an unexpected role for this ship's pig. I don't suppose the cook knows about this. No, sir. Alric looked down at the floor. He shuffled his feet. The pig is supposed to be chained up, getting fat. 
Please don't tell the cook, sir. I'm in plenty of trouble as it is. The captain didn't say anything at first. Then a slight smile tugged at his lips. Son, you never know who will step up with the brains and talent in a time of need and be right the one for the job. We'll keep this between us. Shouting from the deck above interpreted moment, the captain looked up. I'd better return to topside. Closing in on our final destination, and we've entered iceberg waters, so we need to be extra alert. You can imagine the per precipitation <laughs> that falls on these coastal areas is significant and can cause a problem with visibility. He laid his hand on Alaric's shoulder. Carry on, sailor. Yes, sir. Alaric saluted again. But can I ask a question, sir? If it's a quick one. What happens to me once we reach the final destination? The explorer unloads me and the expedition team, then sails away to pick, up, pick us up on the other side of the continent. You will be a part of the skeleton ship's crew. The captain gave him a smile. Meanwhile, the expedition team and I are going dog sled across the entire span of the Antarctic, something never done before. Journeying from food station to food station, if we are successful, we will have made history. Flora gazed at him with admiration. Now there was a born leader. Something about him reminded her of Oscar. Alaric jumped in boldly. I was hoping I could go along on the expedition, sir. The captain laughed. Alaric slumped. I'm sorry, the captain said. It's too much dangerous for a boy. Besides, the ship needs every available hands it can get for the difficult trip. Another shout crackled from the top of the stairs. Loud pounding of boots came right from above them. The captain looked up again. More icebergs, he muttered. I'd better get upstairs. Keep up the good work, son. Just as the captain stepped on the bottom stair, a bone-numbing jolt knocked Flora off her feet. Her ribs slammed into the floor and knocked her breath out of her. The sound splintering wood filled the air, and in a single moment, no one, not even the captain, was controlling of anything. Chapter 22. Flora felt herself skid toward one side of the ship. Barrels and boxes tore loose from their ropes, came tumbling across the hold in the same direction. Crunching sounds seemed to go on forever. She came to a stop against a post. For the tiniest moment, nothing moved. Then the ship slowly right, righted itself. The men above were shouting to one another, but they sounded far away. Flora scrambled her to her feet. A small stream of water just trickled. Really? Came from nowhere and flowed toward her. She couldn't look at anything else. She just watched the stream as it made its way across the floor. Sophia! Her voice was shaking. From the corner she saw Alric stand and run for the stairs. Come on! He shouted. Flora looked around for her friend. Sophia! She squealed. There was no answer. Instead, the far side of the ship burst open. An icy river washed her over her. There was no time to run, no time to scream, no time to even take a breath. The water swept her out from underneath her feet and carried her, bumping along the floor until she smacked her head into a floating barrel. It then banged her into the ship's wall and sent her swirling around away toward the other side. When her head poked above the waves, she choked and coughed and tried to call out, but the cold water had locked up her lungs. Now the water began to raise and foam. Flora was not bumping along the floor any longer. Her feet couldn't touch, except her hooves hit underwater boxes. Flora tried to swim to the stairs. Impossible, the freezing current took her. 
everywhere it wished. She was not the only one struggling. Rats were palling for their lives all around her. Some tried to climb on her, but the water turned her in for in until she didn't know up from down. Finally, her hoofs touched something solid. She hoped it was the stairs. Her head broke free of the foam, and she gasped for air. The water tried to pull her away again. She scrabbled and fought to keep her footing. It was the staircase, she was sure. The rats found the same escape route. They swarmed upward the light and through the open doorway. Flora struggled to climb onto the deep onto the dry step. Just then, something grabbed one of her hind legs. No! She desperately cried to pull away, but the thing kept hold of her, tugging her into the seawater once again. Flora panicked. An octopus must have one of must have had one giant arm wrapped around her, taking her under. Kick, she told herself. Kick with the other leg. She turned her head to aim, but before she could lash out, she saw a face. It was not an octopus. It was the captain. His arm came across her back and held on. His face was gray as if the water had washed the color from it but his eyes were clear and questioning. In answer, Flora focused on getting to the next dry step. It was a good thing she had practiced pulling the big box around the hold. The weight of the captain's body drove her down into a crouch. She straightened her legs slowly and towed the load upward, but it was no use. The water was rising faster than she was. She could escape the captain's grasp by kicking him off. And in her panic, she considered it for a second. Then she gathered her hooves under her and pulled up again and again. Don't give up. She was able to climb four or five steps until the captain's arm slipped off her back. She looked behind her. The man's head rested on a step, and the water was already bubbling around his chin. A pair of swimming rats found a toehold in his shirt, scrambled over his shoulders, and up the stairs. Flora turned around, took the captain's shirt collar in her teeth, and pulled. The captain lifted his head and helped by pushing with his hands, step by step, the two of them began to move out of the rising water, but it was still swirling as high as his waist. Flora felt faint. She couldn't take in air fast enough. Her legs were trembling now from fear, from cold, and from the weight of the captain. She didn't dare let go. She was sure if she did, she would lose him. But she could hardly stand up and he was starting to slide back. I'm sorry, she wanted to say. I failed. A shadow fell over her. Hands reached down to drag the captain up the last few stairs. Flora let go of his collar and stepped aside. Alaric was not a big person, but by sitting on the top step and heaving his whole body backwards, he was able to slowly haul the captain through the door onto the deck. Flora scrambled after them. The sea had almost filled the hold now. Alaric tried to lift the captain to his feet, but failed. I have the captain, he shouted over his shoulder. Don't leave yet. Two sailors ran up. They lifted the man up by his feet and shoulders and hurried to where the last lifeboat was bobbing next to the ship's rail. Several men reached out to take the captain into their arms and lay him in the bottom of the boat. The two had carried the captain followed. Alric held Flora into the boat, climbed over the rail, and stumbled aboard last. They pushed off, and a few men paddled hard with oars to create a distance between the small craft and the ship. Flora looked back when she thought she heard 
barking coming from the deck, but she couldn't see anything. As Flora felt the lifeboat find its own rhythm against the waves, the explorer groaned and twisted and tipped over sideways, water streaming down its rounded boards. As a wave rose from its roar, roll and crawled at the side of the lifeboat. Flora found her feet knocked out from under her once again, but this time she landed on something soft. It was the captain. He moaned as Flora struggled off him. She found her footing, climbed onto one of the bench seats, and looked at the waves. The explorer was still drifting on its side, sinking lower and lower. Then a puff of air bubbled as if the ship were breathing its last breath. The men stopped rowing and everyone turned to watch. The ship was there one moment and then suddenly it was not. No big wave followed this time, no white foam, no sign to mark where it had gone down. It was just gone. Bobbing wooden boxes, barrels, and bits of ship parts were all that was left. The iceberg they had struck towered above them like a silent ghost ship, and the men with the oars paddled clear. Flora shivered. She didn't know if it was from fear or cold. She spotted a small brown shape floating near their boat. It was a stout-hearted rat, paddling hard, with its long tail streaming out behind. For the first time, Flora felt sorry for her old enemy. The rat's head was swallowed by a small wave. When it popped back up, it seemed less strong, less brave. Flora knew from her own short swim that no land animal could last long in the freezing waters. When the rat went under again, she quickly looked away. On board the lifeboat, some men sat with their heads in their hands and some rowed. No one spoke. Soon they were pushing through a thick soup of ice and ocean. It was hard to see where the sea left off and where the land, if one could call it that, began. Ahead of them, another lifeboat was fighting to find a way through, a tiny leaf in rough water. The only sound was knocking the ice against the sides of the boat. Wait, where was Sophia? Flora looked for a spark of orange in the icy water all around. And had she made it onto the other lifeboat by some chance? Flora didn't see how. The frenzy of the past few moments had been terrible, but the picture in Flora's mind of Sophia fighting in the freezing waters was going down with the ship was even worse.